Hello, I'm Jonathan Inahosa. I'm uh, the chief of design for Defunct Magazine, and uh, I will be introducing Catherine Rhodes Fields, uh, MFA and MATESL. Um, Fields is professor and division chair for the visual arts at Houston Community College in Houston. Uh, Fields is also the former president and CEO of Print Matters, a 501c3 nonprofits organization in Houston that organizes and implements the internationally recognized Print Houston Biennial. In addition to being an arts educator and advocate, Fields is an internationally recognized artist who recently received prizes at the 8th International Biennial of Small Size Prints in Tetovo, Macedonia. Uh, has traveled and participated as both an artist and representative of the United States for the Fine Arts International Assembly in uh, man, Bosnia and Herzegovina, as well as for the tourism organization uh, of Kraljevo's 40th Art Colony at Studenica in Serbia and conducted artist workshops at SNAP, the Society of Northern Alberta Printmakers in Canada, and the University of Veracruz in Calapa, Mexico. Uh, her handmade books with prints are featured in two publications, 500 Handmade Books, Inspiring Interpretations of a Timeless Form, and the Lark Studio Series, Handmade Books. Fields created broadside prints for American authors, Jeff Jeffrey Eugenides and Ace Atkins, and the 2013 uh, Pulitzer Prize in Fiction winner, Adam Johnson. Fields' work can also be found in many permanent collections, including the Mississippi Museum of Art, Christ Church Polytechnic Institute of Technology, Christ Church New Zealand, Pro, uh, Proyecto ACE print collection, Buenos Aires, Argentina, and the William D. Merwin Collection of Contemporary Art, St. Louis, Missouri, to name just a few. I would say that uh, the thing that I found most intriguing about uh, uh, Professor Fields' work uh, was the range of processes that you bring into your work, into your prints. Um, I find that multidisciplinary approach uh, is something that that's uh, always very uh, interesting to me. Um, being able to to find where boundaries are and 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 push them and and meld them to one another. Um, so I, I really look forward to uh, hearing what you have to say. Thank you. Great. Well, hi, uh, thank you so much. Um, I don't know if you guys can see me or not, or hear me, but hopefully you can. Um, good, good, good. Well, I wanna uh, thank you all for having me here today um, and to give me an opportunity uh, to be amongst um, such an amazing group of people. Thank you so much. And uh, Miranda, thank you so much um, for bringing me to this. I really appreciate it. Um, so it's great to meet you all. Um, and going back to Jonathan's question about my processes, um, yes, I, I do. I mix up processes a lot. And my background in my art making um, kind of spans a wide berth of different techniques. I always tell my students, and I put it into practice, that what we learn in school um, are all just tools. Um, they're not, you know, when you walk out in the world, you're not just a painter, you're an artist, you're not just a printmaker, you're an artist. And so it's about what you, the tools and how you use them to kind of manifest your concept is what's ultimately the most important thing about your art making and your art. Is that what you were thinking about, Jonathan? Or did you want me to specifically talk about the different wacky techniques that I use? <laughs> Yes, uh, I, I was looking through on your website and, and I came across uh, a, really just like a whole variety of things. And even where I, when I clicked on when it said woodblock prints, it was not at all what I was expecting. Right. Um, you know, the, the chicken fat, uh, mm -hmm. you know, things, just things that uh, I guess uh, make me really want to explore even further in, in my own personal process. Well, that's, that's awesome. Yeah. And so I think a lot of people that are familiar with printmaking, they would see, you know, woodblock prints, and then they would imagine that it was a more of a Western tradition of like carved images that are very graphic, um, that we're used to seeing, especially like German expressionistic woodcut prints and things. And that was what I was trained to do. Um, the woodblock prints that are on my website are actually in the style of Mokuhanga, which is the Japanese tradition of using rice paste. Um, and pigment 
And then what I did was I rubbed it into um, the wood, you rub it into the wood with a brush as opposed to a brayer, which is the more Western style. But uh, I was uh, working in St. Louis, Missouri, um, early in my career, and I interacted with another colleague of mine um, named Michael Schneider, and um, he was actually, he was trained in um, Nagoya, Japan, and he introduced me to the whole technique. But he also talked to me a little bit about rice paste and the scarcity of good rice paste, because rice um, as a product um, was in great scarcity, but also too was attached to a lot of racism. So a lot of Japanese artists would not use, if rice wasn't available, they wouldn't use rice from other countries, so on and so forth. And so it made me think about what other foodstuffs that had similar chemical properties and abilities as rice does um, that I could use. So it kind of reflect more about me. And so as you probably read on my website, I am from Mississippi. And so um, one of the foodstuffs that tends to come up in conversation about rice in the United States is that of fried chicken. But it also reflects directly to gender as well. Um, at the time when I started these prints, there was a kind of a conversation about porn and chicken. And so I started to use the chicken fat and use recipes um, of the Civil War chicken. And I used the fat, the schmaltz itself, to create the transparency, but also it had the tack that's very similar to rice paste. And I pushed that forward in exploration technique wise and image wise, ultimately leading me to an exhibition called Scratch and Sniff. So. It was a long journey, a <laughs> long explanation. But I, I think it's fun because if you listen to other artists and if you pay attention to history and culture, that you can make really good choices. Um, and, but of course, the chicken fat prints um, are not archival, right? But that's also, to me, part of the process of being an artist is that, you know, if you pre I preserve them, they're actually still. Um, I exhibited them just recently this past summer during Print Houston um, at a gallery in Montrose. So they're still, they're still in good shape, <laughs> but they change. And I think that's also the beautiful thing as well. Uh, did you uh, study printmaking in college? I did and I didn't. So in my undergraduate degree, I was a painting major and I was introduced to printmaking when I was a student at the Glasgow School of Art. And I, uh, that was where my first introduction was. Now I did a little printmaking in high school, but that was where I really fell in love with printmaking. And then I pursued printmaking as my master's degree. And um, so, yeah. <laughs> It's so that's always where I really flourished in the processes. Yeah. It's always an interesting uh, question to me. I guess like just the story of how somebody got in interested in yeah. or used to well, print. You know, printmaking. I think if you think about it in the academic sphere, right, uh, there aren't typically any degree programs dedicated to drawing as an art form. Drawing is usually introduced. As as a foundational level course, um, but I love drawing and um, I drew with paint. I mean, I, I, I hats off to painters, but I drew with paint. That's that's what I did. I mean, I, I knew how to glaze and all the other techniques, but ultimately I just wanted to draw with paint. And so what printmaking did, printmaking allowed me to continue my drawing, but to make multiples. And it really fit my sensibilities of democracy. Printmaking is the most democratic form of art making. It allows your ideas and concepts in art form to be available to multiple people. Um, and so that aspect of it, as opposed to the actual, my love of drawing, it really connected with me also the experimental part of it, the chemistry that's involved, it really kind of aligns with my personality as well. So I'm a very technically driven and organized person. So I think personality wise and interest wise, it really fit the bill. Um, I, one of my questions was, do you have a home studio? And I see you sitting in your studio, so I assume it's at home. It is. I, it's one of two. I have two studios. Um, this is my, what I call my clean studio. So this is where I do my digital editing um, as well as store prints. And also this is where I stitch my handmade books. So this is the clean studio. I actually have a print shop in my two-car garage. Um, yeah, so I actually have uh, two etching presses. Uh, and a two platen um, screen printing press, as well as a book press. 
So I have access to and a smaller block printing press. And so um, I have that, but I'll also share that with, you know, the folding chairs and the washer and dryer. <laughs> But I can get really dirty in there, so that's nice. But yeah, so this is, and this is my uh, flat files and I have my printers and everything here. But yeah, I do. And you know, and uh, one of the great things about being um, kind of trying to be flexible <laughs> as we're all experiencing as an artist is that printmaking, it's very difficult. Um, I've collected all of these pieces of equipment and purchased them over the years. Um, having a home studio is difficult for a lot of printmakers because of the scale of the equipment that you need, right? I mean, and also to the toxicity. And that's another thing that I'm a big advocate for and that's non-toxic printmaking as well. And that was one thing that I brought to the studios at HCC previous to being chair college um so yeah so this is my studio um so uh having that uh space there has that uh being confined at home is that has there been any impact on your on your work oh absolutely i've been a lot more diligent um i i will admit though um i'm fairly i'm in my second year as chair. So I've switched into administration and that has been a, a lot of time. Um, I've been very dedicated to the program at HCC and um, so that's kind of taking me away a little bit from our, our artistic practice. Um, but I have been working in the studio because I ha have had a little bit more time since I've been working here and there. But yes, I have I actually completed a lithographic print. I, I did a, I pulled an edition of five um, just last week and I have another plate ready to go. So I'm really excited about that. So I'm, I'm, I'm playing, I'm getting to have fun, which is good. It, um, I, I don't know if, uh, it, it sounds like you, you haven't exactly had the experience of some of the people that I've been talking to, some of my friends and, um, other artists, and, uh, I guess have been, uh, somewhat depressed um with with things that are going on and now that they have the time to to mm -hmm. sit and work on things um they're they're not finding themselves able to do that um so i don't know if uh if you do have experience with that maybe not necessarily in this particular oh, no absolutely instance. well i do have that experience and, and my heart goes out to them because i went through what i would call a creative block <laughs> artists have creative blocks um, for many years and a lot of it had to do with kind of transition. I mean, having a two car garage and creating a print shop that didn't happen overnight, right? That took many, many years of moving around. I've taught it different states and different places and different institutions. Um, but yeah, I think creative blocks. Um, and I think a lot of times when we are afforded a lot of time, we tend to be the more contemplative type and, and like thinking about ideas. Um, but I think for the most part, um, what I've done and like I have a series of work that I initially gave a lot of thought to and then created a full body of work for an exhibition um, at the, the Gorofichki Collective in uh, Belgrade, Serbia. But before then was just kind of um, something that I did when I was looking for creative juices. And that was um, I have a, an image of a trony, which goes back and reflects to Rembrandt. Um, an image of nobody, but wearing clothing or hats that are associated with a different social class, where I put a plague doctor mask on top of um, a nondescript, any, anyone. And I would use that a lot in my demonstrations in class. And I would go to that. That was my go-to when I couldn't think of anything else to do. And over the past 15 years, I've collected hundreds and hundreds of monotypes and drawings and things of this image, this trony. Um, and then they culminated in some multiple series of work. So, you know, my suggestion to them is just, just keep drawing, right? And, and it will pass. Um, you know, a lot of times, you know, students ask me, do you keep a sketchbook? And my honest answer is yes, it's on my iPhone, right? I, you know, I think about now that it's, it's shifted a lot, you know, so when I was in school, I mean, I have, to, I have so many sketchbooks um, and they take up room, and they take up space and I cherish them. Um, but I'll also think of my phone and my computer as my sketchbook. I mean, just before I got on this call, I was in Photoshop editing um, you know, so I think, and I'm saving them, you know, so I, I think that just by being active is the best way to kind of see yourself through. And that, that's just my personal advice, you know, <laughs> not a shrink or anything, you know, yeah, just someone that goes through it. But I think we're all in a way, this is such an unusual situation that I think that if we all think about and, you know, get a, you know, 
creative solutions take time and they do take a lot of thought. And if we can put our energies towards that rather than um, maybe if we can do that, that might be helpful. I don't know. Thank you. Um, those uh, Troni pieces you were talking about, those are those zinc etchings that you did? Yes, yes, the encumbrance series. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was the, yeah. So the other, there are other ones that have come before and after that series. But that series I worked on for about three and a half years. Um, yeah, so there's ink plate etchings, uh, editions of four each. Yeah. So when you, uh, how much time do I have, Miranda? Are we done? <laughs> okay. Well, I, had a we can I, I, I can keep <laughs> asking you questions. I, I, I was, I really admired your work so, so oh, much. Thank you. Getting to look through your website and everything. It was, it was really wonderful. Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate it. Well, my, uh, a lot of people on social media, because my, I've been making these plague doctors for 15 years, they encouraged me. Um, so what I did was I pulled the plague doctor images and made an, an its own website. Um, so if you just Google plague doctor prints, um, it's in the chat. Oh, it's in the chat. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Hey, there we go. Well, thanks so much. Thank I, I appreciate y'all spending time with me tonight. So, uh, the reason Catherine is joyously here with us this evening is because she was my artistic mentor. I had the, the joy of taking her class not once but twice. Um, even though I wasn't going to get credit for it the second time, I just had to take it a second time. Um, and I'm very lucky because I'm one of her last group of students right there towards the end sure, before yeah. she became the big chair that she is now. Um, and as you can tell, if you look at the logos for our magazine, uh, she was very visually influential. And my chief of design is also a printmaker, so maybe slightly influential in that as well. <laughs> um, Jonathan has done, Catherine, he's done all of our prints for us. They're amazing. So. They're amazing. Jonathan, great job. Thank you. Miranda, thank you so much for having me here tonight. I miss seeing you. Soon. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully. Hopefully.